Joshua 11, we're going to read verses 10 through 15. Read the verses responsibly. We begin together on verse 10, and I'll read 11. We'll alternate like that till we read through verse number 15 of Joshua chapter 11. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture all of us standing please to read God's word and let's begin together in verse 10 of Joshua 11 ready and Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword for Hazor before time was the head of all those kingdoms and they smote all the souls that were therein with the edge of the sword utterly destroying them There was not any left to breathe, and he burnt Hazor with fire. And all the cities of those kings, and all the kings of them, did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, Israel burned none of them, save Hazor only." That did Joshua burn. And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe. Let's read 15 together also. That's our text verse for the day. Ready? As the Lord commanded Moses his servant... So did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the good music today. It's been a blessing and encouragement and uh, to our heart, to our soul. And Lord, I pray that Uh, our hearts are prepared and ready to receive the truth that you have for us from your word this morning. I pray, Lord, you'll be with the special as it's sung and help us to focus. Lord, may each one of us in our heart ask you to speak to us this morning and that you'll help us not to allow our minds to wander. But Lord, I pray that we'll listen carefully to the words of the song and that we'll ask you to put our heart in tune with your heart. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Yeah. 
Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that it's a well of water springing up that never will run dry. We love you today, and Lord, I pray for your help as we come to the preaching of your word. Lord, I I want you to control my thoughts today, and I pray that you'll help me to say what I ought to say and the way it ought to be said and to leave unsaid things that don't need to be said. Lord, I pray that thy Holy Spirit would minister to the hearts of your people this morning. Lord, help us to uh, grasp the truth that we have today. May it help us to be better servants of yours, to have a closer relationship with you, and to glorify you in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. So control these, these next few minutes that we look into your word together. May your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. There's an old recipe for rabbit that starts out with these instructions. First, catch the rabbit. Priorities. First things first. Most of us have priorities. Many, what we say our priorities are, are not actually what our priorities are. The story is told of a prosperous young investment banker who was driving his new BMW down a mountain. It had begun to snow and the roads were getting pretty slippery and sure enough as he veered around a sharp turn he lost control and began sliding off the road toward a steep cliff. At the last possible moment, he was able to get his seatbelt off and he flung open his door and he leaped from the car, which then plummeted to the bottom of a ravine and burst into a ball of flames. Although he escaped with his life, he did have a very serious injury. Somehow, as he was leaping from the car, His arm was caught on the hinge or near the hinge of the door and it had been torn off at the shoulder. A passing trucker saw the accident and his rear view mirror, he pulled his rig to the side and he ran back to see if he could help. And when he got to the scene, the banker was standing on the roadside looking down at his burning BMW and he was oblivious to any injury that he had. He was simply moaning, my BMW, my new BMW. The trucker pointed out to the the banker about his shoulder. He said, son, you got bigger problems than that car. He said, we got to find your arm. Maybe the surgeons can sew it back on. The banker looked where his arm had been. He paused for a moment, then he groaned. Oh, no, my Rolex, (laughs) my new Rolex priorities 
What are your priorities? I'm going to talk to you this morning about first things first. First things first. I want you to look at the scripture this morning, Joshua 11. Notice verse 15. As the Lord commanded Moses' servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Notice, Joshua did not do everything. He did do everything he was commanded to do. The commands of God are the big things. The commands of God are the important things. The commands of God are the first things. In fact, Jesus said, if you love me, what will we do? Keep my commandments. Keep his commandments. So the, and, and listen, have you, have you lived long enough to understand something that the big things, the big jobs, the big people in your life never demand your attention? It's the little things, little jobs that demand your attention. Several years ago at a pastor's conference, the pastors in attendance were surveyed about their priorities. Brother Cato, they were asked, what is your number one priority? And overwhelmingly, number one on the list was prayer. Would be their number one priority as ministers of God. Then at the same questionnaire was asked, what do you spend most of your time doing and it list, you, you would list and last on the list of what they spent their time doing was prayer so what I said was my top priority in reality doesn't get the time that I say it should get so Joshua is taken over from Moses and he has many things to do I'm sure Big shoes to fill, taking over for Moses and leading, uh, estimates vary, but somewhere between two and three million people. Did he do everything that Moses did? No, he didn't. But the Bible does say he did all that the Lord commanded Moses to do. That means that he left undone some things so he could do the things that were commanded for him to do. For the Christian, it's very important that we understand we can spend our time doing some good things and even doing some right things, but then we find we have no time to do the things that God has commanded us to do. And we do not do all that God has commanded us to do. Our priority must be to do what God has commanded us to do. That has to be the priority. In a book called A Practical Guide to Prayer, the author, Dorothy Haskins, tells about a noted concert violinist. And they ask her, what was the secret to your mastery of the violin? And she answered the question with two words. She said, planned neglect. And they asked her to explain that. And she said, well, there were many things that used to demand my time. When I went to my room after breakfast, I would make my bed, straighten the room, start dusting and then sweeping and do whatever was necessary. And then when I finished my work, I'd practice the violin. But that system prevented me from accomplishing what I wanted to on the violin. So I reversed things. And I deliberately planned to neglect everything else until my practice time was completed. And that program of planned neglect is the secret to my success. And I would tell you, Christian, that's the secret of the Christian success. There are things you're going to have to plan to neglect 
so that you and I may do all that God has commanded us to do. If not, the little things, the unimportant things that cry for our attention will get our time and get our attention and what God has commanded us to do gets crowded out. Let's take, for example, what, what are first things first? The first thing we have is to spend time with God. I want you to take your Bible this morning and look at uh, two places with me. Get Mark chapter 3, would you please? Mark chapter 3 and then uh, put a finger in John chapter 14. Mark chapter 3 and then John chapter 14, please. Mark 3. And John 14. In Mark 3, notice, if you will, verse number 13, the Lord Jesus says, He goeth up, that's Jesus, into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve. These are the twelve original disciples of Jesus. So he chose twelve, and he chose, he ordained them what? That they should be, what's the next two words? With him. What's the first priority of those disciples? To be with Jesus. To be with Him. Then He'll send them forth to preach. But you understand, their first priority was to be with Him. Christian, what's your first priority? Be with Him. That's your first priority. Jesus said in John 14, as He's preparing His disciples for His death on the cross and His departure back to heaven, he tells them, in familiar verses to us, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Well, why would he do that? That where I am, there ye may be also. What's his desire? What's the Lord's desire even when He goes to heaven, is that we would be with Him. That we would be with Him. That's got to be the priority of every believer. <clears throat> We've been called into the fellowship of His dear Son. God in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve would come down, it appears in, in, in the count in Genesis, and take walks with them in the cool of the day. And, and had fellowship with with Adam and Eve, and, and, and enjoyed time with them. And you know what happened when the serpent beguiled Eve and Adam and Eve took of the fruit of that tree and they, they, they knew that they had sinned against God and when God came down to take the walk, they hid from God. Now, there's no, now they don't have the fellowship with God. In fact, God had to banish them from His presence in the garden, did He not? and put a an angel with a flaming sword there to keep them out. And that, that intimacy, that fellowship with God was broken. And now, man, it, there, there were no more walks with God. There was no more fellowship with God. And, and that, that's what, by the way, that's why Christ came. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, not just those who were lost. I think that which was lost, that which was lost was man's ability to be with God and fellowship with God. You aren't just saved so you don't go to hell. That is a wonderful side benefit. And I'm glad about it. But that isn't the reason, well, I'm not going to hell, that's all that matters. No, 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 what matters is are you fellowshipping with God? Are you taking the time to be with Him? That's our priority. We're called into the fellowship of His dear Son. Prayer time. Time in God's Word. You know what? Those are the big things. Those are the big things. If you ask most Christians, they would say, that's, that's at the top of my priority list. Spending time with God and spending time in His Word and spending time in prayer. To study, to meditate, to memorize God's Word. And yet, yet, you find out that why is it so hard to make the time? 
Most people, their biggest complaint, well, I just don't have the time. It's interesting, though. Time for the radio. Time for the iPod or the iPad or the music or the books or the magazines or the cell phone or the computer or the TV. All those things that God never commanded, boy, they sure can take my time. And somehow, I have time for those. But I don't have time to spend time with God. I, 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 let, I allow those other things that God never commanded <clears throat> to fill up my time. I don't have the time to do what God has commanded me to do. You must schedule the big things. Do you hear me? You must schedule the big things and let nothing hinder that schedule. You're in John. Go to your left to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Here's Jesus. I'm trying to think where I want to start with this. Let's look at verse number 16. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus did, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Jesus said unto them, Come after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. So he calls Andrew and, and Simon Peter, then he sees, in verse 19, James and John, and he calls them in verse 20, and they followed him. And then verse 21, they go into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he goes in the synagogue and he teaches, and they're astonished at his doctrine and the authority by which he speaks. And in the meanwhile, in the synagogue, a man with unclean spirits there, and they're, they're talking to Jesus. And verse 25, he rebukes him, saying, Hold thy peace, come out of him. And the unclean spirit tore him and cried with a loud voice, came out of him. So he casts out the unclean spirit. And then verse 29, when they were come out of the synagogue, he went into Simon, Andrew, and with James and John, in the house of Simon and Andrew. And then his, Simon's wife's mother, his mother-in-law, lay sick of a fever. And so they tell Jesus about it. He comes and he, he heals her of the fever and she ministers to them. And then at evening, <clears throat> when the sun sets, they brought in him all that were diseased and then that were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the door. And what did he do? He healed many that were sick of diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not devils to speak because they knew him. Now look at me. He, he calls Peter and Andrew. He calls James and John. He teaches in the synagogue. He casts out an unclean spirit, gets out of the synagogue, goes to Peter's house and his mother-in-law sick. He said, well, I'll heal her. And then everybody brings their sick people to him and he heals them and casts out devils. I'd say he'd had a pretty busy day. I'd say that's a pretty full day, wouldn't you? Look at verse 35. And in the morning, he hit snooze on his alarm and slept for he was tired. No, that's how our account would read about us. Well, I had such a long day yesterday, and boy, I ministered all day long. I, I need to sleep. Now, what's it say Jesus did in the morning? Rising up a great while before day. Did you know the sun comes up gradually? Some of you ought to discover that. By the time some of you wake up, you just think someone just flipped a switch and it comes on in the sky. You get up. A great while before day, what did he do? He went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. He got up a great while before day. Why do you think Jesus got up a great while before day? He wanted to be alone. Dude, the best time to be alone is I'll get alone with God while everyone else is still sleeping. You know what that's called? A priority. If I wait, if I wait 
until other people wake up and other activities get going. That which God has commanded me to do gets shoved aside. You ever had one of those mornings? And you didn't get up with God and didn't spend time in His Word? And you fully intended to get to it later that day or that evening? I mean, in your mind, you figured out, I get home, I'll do this, and then I'll sit down and get my Bible reading done, and I'll spend time with God. And how many of you went through the day, and things began to happen, and different things took place, and you lay your head on your pillow that night, and your first thought is, I never read the Bible today. Ever happened to you? I'm not the only one? Okay. That's why early in the morning, well, I'm just not a morning person. Let me ask you a question. If the President of the United States, if you got a phone call from someone in the office of the presidency saying, he's requesting a meeting with you, we have a plane, we've arranged a plane tickets for you, you're flying to Washington, D.C., and then he's meeting with you at 6.30 in the morning in the Oval Office, would you be there? Would you say, you know, I'm not really a morning person. No, you'd be there. Matter of fact, many people, when it's vacation time, you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning, get on the road. You're excited to get going. And you want to try to get down the road a ways before the traffic gets, gets heavy. Or while well, the kids will still sleep for a few more hours and we can get, we can get some traveling in and peace and quiet. Whatever the case is, you don't have a problem getting up then. Priorities. Priorities. Mary and Martha. Remember, Martha, you're cumbered about much serving. Mary hath chosen the needful part. What was Mary doing? Sitting at Jesus' feet. She is having the priorities right. George Mueller, having read the Bible through 200 times, made this statement. I look upon it as a lost day when I've not had a good time over the Word of God. Friends often tell me, this is the 1800s, friends often tell me, I have so much to do, so many people to see, I cannot find time to study the Scripture. Perhaps, he said, there are not many who have more to do than I. For more than half a century, half a century is 50 years. Listen, I've never known one day when I did not have more business than I could get through. For four years, I have had annually 30,000 letters. If you're doing the math, that's 2,500 letters a month, I think. Most of those have passed through my own hands. On top of that, as pastor of a church with 1,200 believers, great has been my care. Besides, I have the charge of five orphanages, also a publishing depot, the printing and circulating of millions of tracts, books, and Bibles. But I've made it a rule never to begin work until I've had a good season with God and His Word. And the blessings I have received have been wonderful. It's no accident we still talk about George Mueller. The influence that he had. One man said, one day I saw a peddler selling wares from door to door. I accosted the man with the usual greetings, after which I remarked, it's a grand thing to be saved. Eh, said the peddler, it is, but I know something better than that. And better than being saved, I asked with astonishment, what can you possibly know that is better than that? And he looked at me and said, the companionship of the man who saved me. The companionship of the man who saved me. That's what it's about. That's priority number one for the believer.
spending time with God. Number two is soul winning, witnessing. <clears throat> that's our number one service as a believer. That's, that's given to individuals, but it's also given collectively as a church. And it's amazing how far away... Listen, it's not that the church desires to neglect the number one service, and that is getting the gospel to the lost. It's that we spend all our time doing things that God never commanded. I, I, you, you can look online and go to church websites and look at their calendar, and you're going to see softball night, and you're going to see aerobics class, you're going to see concerts, you're going to see outings, you're going to see dinners, you're going to see fellowships, you're going to see dramas. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not opposed to those things. But wait a minute. You, you, you find something out that God never commanded us to have church picnics. God never commanded us to have sports programs. God never commanded us to have cantatas. Nothing wrong with those things, but they weren't commanded by God. And if we're not careful, what happens is we fill all of our schedule up with these things that God didn't command. And then you know what? Hey, time to go soul winning. Hey, come on. Oh, man, I've been gone every day this week. I can't go on Saturday. I can't be gone another day. Because we filled all our time up doing things that weren't commanded. We don't have time to do what God has commanded us to do. Boy, it's quiet this morning, isn't it, Bob? Man, I feel, feel awful lonely up here. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. We read it earlier in Mark, I mean in uh, Mark 1 when, when he said, Follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. Jesus didn't say, you follow me, I'll make you become a better softball player. Follow me and I'll make you be able to become a, a better singer or a worship team leader. Follow me and I'll make you to be fishers of men. A mission in Africa told the story of an elderly woman who was reached with the gospel. She was blind and could not read or write. But she wanted to share her newfound faith with others. She went to the missionary and she asked for a Bible in French. And when she got it, she said, please underline John 3.16 in red and mark the page so I can find it. The missionary wanted to see what she was going to do with that, so he followed her and one afternoon, just before school let out, she made her way to the door of the school. And as the boys came out of the school, when school was dismissed, she would stop one and ask if he knew how to read French. When the reply would be yes, she would ask him to read the verse that was marked in red. And then she would ask him, do you know what this verse means? And then she'd tell him about Christ. It is said that out of the boys that accepted Christ as their Savior, 20 Four of those boys went on to be pastors of churches in Africa because a blind woman who couldn't read or write witnessed to them and gave them the gospel. What's our excuse? What keeps you from witnessing and giving the gospel? It was so... It, it, it's so convicting yesterday, you know, when Brother Terrell talked about the couple, I think he, had, he was on a trip and he stopped in at a, did he say Starbucks to get a coffee, I think, is that where he met the, and a couple came in behind him, they were speaking Arabic, he turned around and said something in Arabic and they both look at him like, you know, because he couldn't believe somebody knew, number one, they knew what they were saying, but someone who could speak their language. Here, I think they had been in America six years or seven years, and he, he said, you know, when you go over to the Middle East and you go into another country, they're, 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 you, you always have people say, welcome to Jordan, welcome to Iraq, welcome to uh, wherever the, the country is. They, they welcome you. They're very welcoming. He said, you know, and I don't know if anybody, you've probably had this many times, but I just want to tell you, 
welcome to America. He said, and they hung their head. And he looked at him and he said, you're the first person to ever say that to us. How sad. That's just, that's just, being, just being nice. Let alone someone telling about Christ. No, just who's been, who's been least welcoming to you. And if, listen, if, if God's people aren't, who, who is? Who's going who's gonna to show them the love of Christ if we're not going to show them? A pastor passed a big department store and prompted by the Spirit to go in and talk to the owner about his salvation. He went inside and found him and he said this. He said, I've talked to you about beds and carpets and bookcases, but I've never talked my business with you. <clears throat> would you give me a few minutes to do so? And the man said, of course I would. And he led him back to his private office where the preacher took out his New Testament and gave the man of the store, the businessman, the plan of salvation and told him his need of Christ. Tears began to roll down the owner's cheeks and he prayed and asked Christ to be his Savior. And he said this, Pastor, I'm 70 years of age. I was born in this city and I, I would say more than 100 ministers and probably more than 500 church officers have known me as you have and I have done business with them. But in all these years, you're the only man who has ever spoken to me about my soul. Where's our priorities? Most Christians, if we ask you how important is it for you to, to, to see other people saved, you'd put it pretty high on the list. But then think about the last seven days or the last 14 days or the last 21 days or the last month. How much time have you given to giving the gospel to somebody else? That's really your priority. Joshua did not do all that was commanded him to do. He did all that the Lord commanded Moses to do. Priority of spending time with God, our priority of soul winning, our priority of the home. Our priority of the home in Ephesians 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul gives instructions here about relationships. He deals with the wife and the husband, a husband and wife. He deals with children. He deals with uh, uh, employees and employers and and, and he deals in the home with husbands and wives. He says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, that means you do what's best for them means you willingly, sacrificially give to meet their needs, not expecting anything in return. One of the most difficult things in, in, a, an, in marriage counseling is when you speak to the wife about what they should do or the husband what they should do, inevitably they come back and they say, I did what you said and they didn't do anything. I did what you said and she just did this. And, and you're not doing what you do to get something in return. You're doing it because it's right to do. Say, why should a husband love his wife? Because that's what God commanded you to do. I know, I remember Dr. John Rice, I just got to hear him in his latter years of his life. And... He said, he said, my wife would ask me if, she said, John R., what she called him. John R., do you love me? He said, yes, I love you. And she would say, why do you love me? And he'd always have glasses. He'd always put his glass in his mouth like that. He said, because God told me to. 
And she said, that doesn't do anything for me, John R. But you understand? If I just said I loved you because you're young and pretty, you may not always be young and pretty. If I liked you because your skin is such a nice complexion, you may not always have the nice complexion. If I liked you because you have the hourglass figure, you may not always have an hourglass figure. But if I loved you because God says for me to love you, I'll always love you. Because I want to obey the command of God. Now the Bible says in 1 Peter 3 that husbands dwell with your wives according to knowledge. According to knowledge. You know what that means, fellas? It means a man is to know his wife. You're to make a study of her. I know. That's, that's opposite of what the world view is. What does the world say? Ha! Huh, women. Can't figure them out. He'll never understand a woman. It's not what God says. God says you're to, you're to dwell with them according to knowledge. It doesn't say you degrade them. It doesn't say you criticize them. It doesn't say you hit them over the head with your Bible and say, woman, you're supposed to submit to me. It's not what it says. Most husbands, though, Work, eat, sleep, play games, have hobbies, do yard work. They do all, and by the way, all good things. And neglect the one thing God commanded them to do. Love and know their wives. The reason men throw their hands up, I just can't know women. How much time have you spent studying your wife? Thinking about her, analyzing her, understanding what makes her tick, asking God to help you and give you wisdom and how to love her and help her. Women are to be, wives are to be a help meet for their husband, to help meet his needs, to be a help meet for him. And though you care for the house and you care for your children and possibly uh, work a job outside the home, understand something. None of that is commanded of you. It's commanded that you be a help to your husband. Don't miss the main thing by getting so involved with all the other things that aren't commanded but seem so important to us. Children, Parents seem so intent today about, well, i got to play ball with them or go to the park with them or take them here, take them there, buy them this, buy them that. And, and I'm not opposed to those things, but listen, none of that's commanded. You know what is commanded? Look in Deuteronomy chapter 6. You know what's commanded? Teach your children to love the Lord their God. That's what's commanded. How much time have you spent your children teaching them about God? Teaching them about the things of God. Oh, we had a fun time. We went here. We went here. We did this. We do that. Not opposed to that. I think that's good. But if you take all your time doing that and you didn't spend any time teaching them about the things of God, you have missed the mark as a parent. You've missed the mark. You have been so caught up in doing everything, you've left undone what God commanded you to do. We're in a mess in America. You know, the, I was reading some statistics this week about that were put out by the Memphis Police Department on why we have delinquent children. Every 47 seconds, a child is abused or neglected. Every 26 seconds, a child runs away from home. Every seven minutes, a child is injured or killed by a gun. Every two days, 25 children are killed by guns. Every 53 minutes, a child dies in poverty. Every day, 
135,000 children bring a gun to school. That's boggling. Across America. Every day, six teenagers commit suicide. Oh, we only hear about it when they do it live on Facebook. But for that one you hear about, there's at least five others that have taken their life as well. Every day, 2,989 children see their parents get a divorce. And they conclude their article saying it's tough being a kid these days. Now they give their solutions about the failure of the family and the depersonalization of neighborhoods and, and poverty and etc., things like that. But, but the truth is, i tell you what the answer is. The answer is get back to parents doing what God commanded them to do and, and teach your children that they're accountable to God for what they do and that you're loving them and caring for them. You're bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's what God commanded you to do. We tend to do all the other things and, we, and it's not wrong to do the other things, but I tell you what, it's wrong to do all these other things and leave undone what God said was the main thing to do. Does that make sense? Are you, are you with me? I know you're hungry. You want to go home and eat lunch. Let me give you a quiz. This probably won't affect many young people, but it'll affect probably anybody who may be 30 or older, maybe 40 or older. What can you name first? The Ten Commandments are the ingredients of the Big Mac from McDonald's. To all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Is that right, Don? Ah, good answer. Good answer. You don't know. Now, Don will give us the Ten Commandments. I think you could. That's right. You know, in a survey of believers, these are a survey of what they call evangelicals, 80% knew the all-beef patties, but 60, only 60% recognized do not kill as one of the Ten Commandments. 45% knew honor your father and mother. 34% knew remember the Sabbath day, and only 29% recognized do not have any idols. We know our hamburgers were a little shaky on the Ten Commandments. Now I want to give you three practical suggestions and I'll let you go have lunch. Number one, Write down what God has commanded you to do. Write down what God has commanded you to do. And in and, and every role that you have, you may be a, a, a wife, but you're also a daughter. You may be a sister. You may be a, <clears throat> a, a church member. You may be an employee. But in each area of your life, write down what has God commanded me to do in, the, in these particular roles that I have. And whether you're a father or a, a husband, a, a brother, a son, whatever it is that they have, write, write down what God's commanded you to do in that area. Number two, schedule the time to do the commands of God. Remember, they won't demand your time. You must demand their time and make it a priority. Number three, remind yourself. Remind yourself, I'm not trying to do everything. I am trying to do everything God has commanded me to do. You know, if the devil cannot make you bad, he will make you busy. So you will not have time to do what God commands you to do. How's your life? 
is what you say your priorities are and how you live the same? What it is and what you say it is ought to match up. So prioritize your schedule and do what God has commanded you to do. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention, Lord. It's been a little longer than usual this morning. Such an important, important truth. And Lord, I, I don't want to be so busy in my life and succeed at things that you never commanded me to do that are not important. But they sure took a lot of my time. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would take this reminder from Joshua that what Joshua did was he did everything that you commanded Moses to do. And help us to to, to, to look at our lives and to prioritize and put first things first of what you have commanded us to do. Help us not to get so busy doing the other things that we do not do what you've commanded us to do. Help each one of us with our priorities. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. Wonder how many folks this morning would say, Pastor, I the Lord has spoken to my heart this morning about my priorities. What I say they are and what they are aren't always the same. And you know, I'm I'm battling this spending time in my life doing things that God hasn't commanded me to do, that I'm leaving undone some things that I know He's commanded me to do. And by His grace this morning and with His help. That's going to change. And I'm going to focus and I'm going to prioritize my life doing what God has commanded me to do first. Then doing other things that He's not necessarily commanded me to do. They're not bad things. They're good things. But I don't want to do all the good things and leave out the most important things. What God has commanded me to do. I wonder how many believers here this morning would say, Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart today. Pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment I'll pray and we'll have your invitation. If you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, then there's no better time than this morning to come. We'll have someone take a Bible and show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven. If you're today and you're saved and you've ever been scripturally baptized, you come and say, I want to obey the Lord in baptism. If you're here today and you're saved and you're baptized and you believe this is where you ought to belong, then you come and say, I'd like to belong to Bible Baptist Church. Christian, you just want to come and pray? Come and ask God to help you do all that He's commanded for you to do and keep your priorities right in your life. Heavenly Father, have your way in this invitation now. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. I pray that each one would do what you're telling them to do in their heart today. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist plays. As she plays where the Bible sing, Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this morning, will you please? Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Oh, That's right. to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender. I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed 
Savior, I surrender all. Father, we thank you for this morning now. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts today. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, I'm thankful for faithful people in their place today, and I pray you'll give us a good afternoon. Lord, make us mindful of your presence with us as we go from this place, and then bring us back this evening for the evening services. And Lord, we uh, anticipate you speaking to our hearts again this evening. So, Lord, watch over us and use us. May others see Christ in our life today, even, as we go about our duties. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 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 I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joint hands with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight.